Okay, so we are going to get started. Welcome everyone to uh, the Western Heritage Center's High Noon Lecture. We're really, really excited today. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Brianna Theobald. Um, we were first introduced to Brianna's work when we were doing research for our Saints and Sinners exhibit, and we came across her book, Reproduction on the Reservation, and doing research for Susie Yellowtail. Uh, so this year we were really, really excited to be able to make the connection and invite her to share some of her work with us. Uh, Dr. Theobald is an assistant professor of history and an affiliate faculty in the Susan B. Anthony Institute for Gender, Sexuality and Women's Studies at the University of Rochester. Uh, she is an award-winning teacher and researcher in the fields of U.S. women's and gender history, the history of Native America, and the history of reproduction. Her first book, Reproduction on the Reservation, Pregnancy, Childbirth, and Colonialism in the Long 20th Century, excellent book, by the way, uh, explores the intersection of colonial and reproductive politics in Native America from the late 19th century to the present. This book has received multiple awards, including the Ermini Wheeler Vogelin Book Award from the American Society for Ethnohistory. Uh, her research on Native women's history has appeared in academic publications, including the Journal of Women's History and the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of American History. And she has also published in venues, including Time Magazine and Washington Post. So I'm going to turn the whole thing over to Dr. Theobald. If you have any questions, feel free to drop, drop them in the chat, uh, and I will give her those questions at the end. So take it away. Thanks so much. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I'm really thrilled to be able to give this virtual talk for the Western Heritage Center in Billings. And I'm really only sorry that I'm not able to be in Montana to do so in person, but maybe next time. Today, I'm speaking with you all from my home in Rochester, New York. Um, Western New York, which is located on the ancestral homelands of the Haudenosaunee people and the Seneca Nation of Indians and Tonawanda Seneca Nation in particular. The subject of my talk this afternoon is histories of health and healing on the Crow Reservation. And I have a, a map here. Um, those of you who are who live in or around the Billings area probably don't need me to point out the Crow Reservation at the bottom of this slide. Um, and I'm going to be talking about um, sort of narrating some of these histories through the story of one remarkable Crow woman, a woman named Susie Walking Bear Yellowtail. During her lifetime, which spanned much of the 20th century, Yellowtail became the first Crow registered nurse. Um, she worked as a nurse at the government hospital at Crow Agency. She also served as a midwife for native um, and non-native women who wanted home births for various reasons. She chaired the Crow Health Committee, uh, conducted public health screenings for the Indian Health Service. She served on national committees, national advisory committees for Indian health. She protested um, the unethical sterilization of Crow women. She helped found the American Indian and Alaska Native Nurses Association. She also danced in the Sundance and supported her husband, Thomas Yellowtail's um, important roles as uh, Sundance chief and healer. And really so much more, I could go, could go on and on. And that's not even to mention her valued roles as mother, auntie, and grandmother. I'm gonna suggest today that Yellowtail's story helps us to understand how crows navigated the diverse healing practices and institutions that coexisted on the reservation and throughout much of Indian country in the 20th century. Her story is of course also notable in its own right as it reveals one woman's uh, fortitude and ingenuity in advocating for the health and well-being of, of herself, her family, her community, and ultimately um, all native peoples. Before I really jump in, I want to first gratefully acknowledge those who have made it possible for me to tell at least a, a small part of Yellowtail's story um, in the book and then in this talk as well. So um, a, a really, really huge thank you to Yellowtail's female descendants, um, especially Connie Jackson, Valerie Jackson, Jackie Yellowtail, and Leslie Caboti. 
And also uh, thank you to Marina Brown Weatherly, who is a family friend of the Yellow Tails and a writer an artist who had the foresight to record a long interview with Susie the summer before um, her death, um, the, the summer before Yellowtail's death, and thus enabled me to come to know Yellowtail, at least in part through her own words. So Susie Walking Bear, later Yellowtail, I'll just refer to her as Yellowtail throughout this talk for consistency. She was born in 1903 in the Pryor District um, on the Crow Reservation, the westernmost district you can see there on the map. Um, two more locations that I would point out um, while I have this map up that are going to be somewhat important in, in Yellowtail's life and trajectory. First, at Crow Agency here toward the top in the Black Lodge District, which was the, um, the government headquarters on the reservation. So that's where there's a boarding school that Yellowtail attended. Um, it's where the hospital where she would later work um, is located. And then down here at the bottom, Wyola, the Wyola district, the southernmost district, which is where she spent much of her adult life. Now, in the decades before her birth, Yellowtail's relatives had endured a period of immense change. The fur traders who entered, um, entered the region in the early 19th century brought, among other things, new diseases. And crows weathered a series of devastating epidemics at mid-century, the middle of the 19th century. In the 1860s and 1870s, the US military fought a series of battles with native nations in the West in an attempt to clear the way for American westward expansion and to protect the interests of encroaching Euro-American settlers. For their part, crows made this strategic decision to ally with the United States and crow warriors fought alongside the US military in a series of battles against their indigenous rivals in the region. But their dependability as military allies didn't save crows from seemingly ceaseless land loss during this period. Crow leaders signed the first Fort Laramie Treaty in 1851, in which the US government recognized about 33 million acres in what is currently Montana and Wyoming as crow land. Less than two decades later, a second Fort Laramie Treaty recognized only about 8 million acres as crow land. Then following reductions in 1892, 1890, 1899, and 1904, federally recognized crow land had been reduced to about 2 million acres, which is actually more or less what you see depicted in red there at the top of the screen. This steady land reduction coincided with the disappear disappearance of the buffalo in the region. Um, that's a, a whole nother history. And it contributed to morbidity and mortality, sickness and death. Malnutrition combined with a forced sedentary lifestyle created the conditions for the rapid spread of disease and an alarming demographic decline followed. In the decade or so before Yellowtail's birth, the Crow Nation lost nearly one third of its tribal population. So the first thing to note for our purposes today is that Susie Yellowtail was born at a historical moment when her people were by, by some measures at a nadir in terms of health, a product of some of these colonial processes. A second and closely related observation worth noting is that Yellowtail's birth coincided with um, the emergence or, or really the um, a kind of expansion of government funded health services on the reservation an admittedly adequate inadequate response to prevailing health conditions, um, as well as a tool in the federal government's ongoing efforts to assimilate native peoples and i'll return to assimilation shortly. Government health services were in fact linked to the land loss that I just described. In that 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, so the, the second Fort Laramie Treaty, the US pledged to assign a physician, a government physician to the reservation. A 1904 agreement, which spelled out the terms for the sale of more Crow land, authorized funding for the construction of a hospital that would open its doors a few years later in 1907. 
Yellowtail, however, again, born in 1903, had little, if any, exposure to government health services in her early years. Her mother delivered her with the assistance of a midwife. If she had had colic as an infant, I don't know, but if she did, her mother would have uh, in all likelihood taken her to a healer, um, generally a female healer who uh, had special, who specialized in treating that ailment. And indeed the, the prior district, the, that westernmost district boasted a number of highly regarded uh, male and female healers who continued to practice their medicine long after the Commissioner of Indian Affairs had criminalized their work, and especially criminalized the work of, of um, the so-called medicine men. Yellowtail's first sustained contact with government-funded health workers was likely in the mid-1910s, when she left prior to attend the government boarding school at Crow Agency. That was maybe about 60 miles or so from her family's home. Indian boarding schools like this one were at the heart of the federal government's assimilation campaign. In the last decades of the 19th century, the federal government shifted from a strategy of military conquest in the West to one of cultural assimilation. The idea as presented by policymakers and social, maker, uh, social reformers was that native peoples could be transformed from wards, government wards, into American citizens if they could be persuaded to renounce their cultural beliefs and practices, to discard their languages, to learn English, to adopt Western attitudes and, and practices and behaviors, and to convert to Christianity. Authorities on the, the so-called Indian problem concluded that the most effective path to, to assimilation was through the next generation. And that's where these boarding schools like the one that Yellowtail attended came into the picture. Generations of Crow and other native children were removed from their homes and, and from their families and placed in often distant um, boarding schools. Here's one such school um, where the objectives of many administrators and teachers are perhaps best summed up by a, a line um, from the founder of one such schools, the, the actually the um, school depicted here. Um, this is Carlisle. Indian school. It was founded, founded by a, name, a man by the name of Richard Henry Pratt. And in his view, the purpose of schools like, like Carlisle were, was to kill the Indian in him and save the man. So it was no longer the objective to kill Indians in a physical sense, but these schools were intended to eliminate all markers of Indianness, of, of indigeneity. Boarding school students received um, a gendered vocational instruction at these schools. As one of Susie's granddaughters explained, uh, the girls were taught to be housewives. Well, actually, what she said was housemaids. They did the cooking, the cleaning, the laundry that kept these schools running. Students also received countless health-related lessons. Some of these lessons concerned um, hygiene practices and ways to avoid the spreading of disease, which is sort of a, a painful historical irony because in many cases the schools themselves became um, sites of the, the rampant spread of disease. Some of these lessons centered on the disparagement of, of so-called medicine men and native midwives and um, preached the, the superiority of government physicians and Western medicine. Reservation boarding schools like that at Crow Agency, that the one that Yellowtail attended, these were not actually the federal government's ideal with regard to the education of Native children. The proximity of, of these schools, of reservation schools, allowed for at least semi-regular contact with a child's family and, and community. And policymakers and, and school officials generally believe that this threatened to reverse the kind of transfer to transformative assimilationist work that the schools were doing. So when it was possible, Native children were instead sent to schools located off the reservation, where the separation from homelands, cultures, and families was more complete. Um, and this 
boarding school here, the Carlisle School that I mentioned, it was located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Uh, when, when Yellowtail was 16 years old, she, she too left her reservation to attend an off-reservation school, in her case, one in Oklahoma. From there, she journeyed, journeyed still further from home when she accompanied a female missionary to Massachusetts. And there she served as a maid and a nanny in that missionary's home. So all of this is important background but we've now reached a critical point in Yellowtail's story. We've reached the moment when Susie Yellowtail begins on the path that would result in her becoming a pretty significant figure in Crow and ultimately American Indian hell. Through a serendipitous series of events that I won't get into, um, Yellowtail ended up enrolling, um, I'm rolling in and attending Boston City Hospital School of Nursing, which is one of the oldest and most prestigious nursing schools in the country. When she graduated in 1927, Susie Yellowtail became the first Crow registered nurse and one of the first Native American registered nurses. Um, this is uh, one of her graduation photos from 1927. Um, Susie Walkie Bear is the, in the center of the back row. Um, this is a, a photograph that is held by the Montana Historical Society. And you can see that it, at some point along the way, someone drew an arrow pointing to um, Walking Bear to, to single her out specifically in this photograph. Within two years, Yellowtail was back at Crow Agency working as a supervisory nurse at the reservation hospital. By this time, Crow Healthways were characterized by what scholars refer to as medical pluralism. The historian Mary Ellen Kelm defines medical pluralism as a continued acceptance of indigenous medicine alongside an ongoing struggle led by native people to strip the overlays of cultural superiority from the provision of non-native medicine. At Crow, reservation employees reported that more than 90% of tribal members accepted hospital care in at least some situations. And for a growing number of women, although still certainly a minority, this included childbirth. This photograph here was actually taken the, the very year that um, Susie Yellowtail began working at the, the reservation hospital. It's a, a photograph of a crow woman, an infant, standing in front of, though you can't see it, um, you can't see much of it, but they're standing in front of the uh, reservation hospital at Crow Agency. Crows generally viewed Western medicine as reasonably compatible with crow healing practices and continued to seek out their own healers in some circumstances. In fact, it's worth noting that the range of Crow healing practices by some measures expanded in the first half of the 20th century, as some tribal members incorporated peyote into their healing repertoire and Crow leaders reintroduced the Sundance, which had been banned in the late 19th century. And I'll return to the Sundance later. For her part, Yellowtail's employment at the Crow Crow, um, Crow Agency Hospital was a brief and overwhelmingly negative experience. She was appalled by how poorly reservation health care compared with that which she had become familiar with in the East. And she found the senior physician and much of the hospital staff to be apathetic and culturally insensitive. Yellowtail later recalled in her interview with uh, Marina Weatherly how she went to bat for mistreated patients. She said, I would have it out with the doctors trying to improve things. It was just really bad. I'd tell those doctors, just because we're Indians doesn't mean you can do this to us. You think you can get away with it, but finally somebody is here who knows what's going on. In the decades that followed Yellowtail's employment, the reservation hospital and also government health services more generally um, emerged as central sites in Crow's struggle for self-determination. Not surprisingly, Yellowtail played a role in this activism. She later recalled that she had been successful in, in agitating for the transfer of two physicians whom she believed provided inadequate or even unethical care. 
It may have been during her time as a government nurse that Yellowtail learned, or at least strongly suspected, that government physicians were sterilizing Crow women without their full knowledge or understanding. Tragically, this is an issue that would soon affect her personally. After leaving the hospital in disgust and frustration, um, Susie married Thomas Yellowtail, and the newlyweds settled on a ranch in Wyola, the, the, the southern district that I pointed to earlier. When Yellowtail gave birth to her first child a year later, she made a point of avoiding the res reservation hospital and instead delivered her daughter, Virjama, in a private hospital at a private hospital in Sheridan. Not too long after, Yellowtail gave birth to a second child, but this time she very, very reluctantly did so at Crow Agency. And I, I can't know exactly why. I suspect that Susie and Thomas had paid for the, the delivery of their first child out of pocket, um, but maybe were unable to do so the second time around. It's also possible that uh, um, the government physician had been willing to authorize this expense the first time and not the second time. I'm not sure. At any rate, what, what I do know is that Yellowtail later described her experience giving birth at Crow Agency as a nightmare and alleged that she almost died as a result of the physician's carelessness. When she prepared for the birth of her third child a few years later, she opted to avoid hospitals altogether. Um, instead, her husband, um, her husband Thomas's aunt, Mary takes the gun, a highly respected midwife with more than two decades of experience, um, attended her delivery at home. And I have a couple of pictures here of Mary takes the gun, um, though in, in each case that these are photos from quite a bit earlier uh, than, than the period I'm talking about. Um, in the photograph on the left, um, takes the gun is the woman standing. She's standing next to her sister um, Sister Lizzie, who is Thomas Yellowtail's mother, and I believe that that photograph was taken in the late 1880s. I always pause and make a point of underscoring this trajectory of, of Yellowtail's reproductive trajectory, um, because I think many people often think about the trans transition from midwifery to hospital childbirth as a linear process that moved precisely in that direction from midwifery assisted home birth to government attended hospital birth. And in fact, it was not unusual for Crow women to move in and out of the hospital based on any number of factors, uh, including their attitudes toward a specific physician or their attitudes toward a particular set of policies that the hospital personnel had in place at any given moment. So unfortunately, things took a negative turn for Yellowtail a few months after her, her third, um, after her home birth, as she was plagued by a terrible pain in her abdomen. She resisted as long as she could, but finally she went to Crow Agency to see the doctor. Um, she may have felt like she didn't have much other choice. During her pregnancy, this doctor, which is not the same doctor who had delivered her second child, this is a, a new physician. Um, and during her pregnancy, this, this new doctor who disapproved of Yellowtail's plans for a home birth, sent her a letter informing her that he would not um, uh, authorize the reimbursement of any medical services that she obtained off the reservation. At her examination, this same senior physician told Yellowtail that she needed an operation to remove a cyst on her ovary. When she woke up, she learned that she had been sterilized. I was so upset, she later recalled. So I can't be entirely sure what happened um, medically in this, in this particular case, but Yellowtail later alleged that this form of aggressive surgery was common at Crow in these years. And government records from this senior physician's tenure confirm an unusually high rate of gynecological procedures like the salpingo oophorectomy performed on Yellowtail. Yellowtail contended that as in her case, women didn't always know about or understand the surgery ahead of time. And she later described the grief and outrage that they experienced in the aftermath. At the national level, the 1930s witnessed the height of eugenic sterilizations. 
It's clear from surviving government documents that reservation employees used eugenic language and drew on eugenic logic in their assessments of social and economic problems on the reservation. On at least a few occasions, this led directly to recommendations that individual women be candidates for sterilization. According to Montana law, however, any sterilizations performed at the Crow Agency Hospital would have needed to be classified as uh, medical or therapeutic rather than eugenic. Um, you, according to this law, eugenic sterilizations could only be performed in certain institutions. It seems though that in at least some cases, these lines were blurred as scholars have, have documented in other contexts as well. In the years following her own salpingo oophorectomy, Yellowtail began another type of work, which under the circumstances doubled as a form of activism. She began serving as a midwife for women who for various reasons didn't want to go to the hospital. She had delivered a number of babies while working at the Crow Agency Hospital, and she combined her Western medical training um, with the, the birthing knowledge that she learned from women in the Yellowtail family. Her midwifery services allowed women um, or provided women with safe alternatives um, to a hospital childbirth. She continued her work as a midwife into the 1950s. And in, in thinking about Yellowtail and, and this, this work that she was doing, I should note that she was not alone in providing midwifery services that combined crow birthing knowledge and hospital-based training, or at least familiarity. Um, as just one more example, Matilda Roundface acted as a midwife for women in the prior district, um, at least until mid-century. Roundface didn't have a nursing degree like Yellowtail did, but she had worked at the Crow Agency Hospital before her marriage. And a field nurse, a, a non-native field nurse in the 1940s had deemed her um, competent and a knowledge, knowledgeable enough to serve as her unofficial assistant. Oral history interviews that I've conducted, as well as others, um, including Tim McCleary, um, faculty at, at the Tribal, Tribal College at Crow Agency, um, make clear that Roundface and Yellowtail both had the complete trust of at least many community women at the time. And as I said, they practiced into the 1950s. Um, but before I get to the 1950s, I should note that World War II in the 1940s brought significant change to Crow country, as it did in, in many Native communities. Um, for one thing, many Crow men and women alike left the reservation, at least temporarily, during the war, either to join the armed services um, or to pursue um, employment opportunities in defense industries. As importantly for our purposes, more importantly for our purposes perhaps, on the health front, um, most reservations experienced a reduction in government health services during the war, including in some cases, though not at Crow, the closure of some of these government hospitals. And that's because resources and manpower were diverted to the war effort. For their part, amidst these changes, Susie and Thomas Yellowtail remained busy raising their children, and Yellowtail, as I mentioned, kept busy um, catching babies. She reemerges as a um, as a quite visible historical figure in the 1950s, a momentous decade in Native American history. And this photograph here of, of Yellowtail in her uh, elk tooth dress was from 1953. Scholars often refer to uh, this period, this post-World War II period, as the termination era, because in the years following the war, policymakers began working to terminate the political status of American Indians or to sever their uh, special legal relationship with the US government. They desired, these policy makers desired, in their own words, to get out of the Indian business, which required the immediate assimilation of Native peoples once and for all. Native legal scholar Vine Deloria once described the termination era as the most traumatic period of Indian existence. Crows were not among the dozens of Native nations whose status was terminated during this period, 
But tribal members remained acutely aware that at any moment they could be could be next. Um, I've recently been doing some writing on the Crow, Crow Indian Women's Club, this really fascinating and important um, reservation-based organization, and their records make very clear. This is a, an organization that lasted decades, but their um, records make very clear that in the 1950s, they were quite concerned about, about termination pressures. That was one of their major areas of focus. Um, and that's in part because termination was not just about political and legal status. It touched virtually every aspect of reservation life, including health. The hospital closures that began during World War II continued uh, in some places in the post-war period as policymakers and key officials in the Bureau of Indian Affairs worked toward the goal of eliminating federal services that benefited only Native peoples. In 1954, Congress passed the Indian Health Transfer Act, which transferred responsibility for Indian health care from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to the Public Health Service. PHS established a division of Indian Health, soon renamed the Indian Health Service, which remains today, or IHS, to accommodate ex its expanded obligations. And you get some sense of the, the bureaucracy at play there. Tribal nations, as well as Native individuals, were divided about the transfer. So some supported it, others opposed it. And that's because the politics behind the bill were complicated. Some of the bill's non-Native advocates correctly believed that the transfer to PHS would bring more funding and, and better, more standardized care to reservations. Others, however, supported the bill because they viewed it as a step toward termination. For their part, Crow leaders displayed a characteristic distrust of change mandated from above. And the months immediately following the transfer only intensified Crow concerns. Patients complained about IHS's inflexibility, about administrators' insistence on operating on a wholesale basis, and about what Crows interpreted as the privileging of rules over lives. Tribal members were, as one Crow produced report on the situation put it, almost in arms over hospital conditions. And nor were they alone in their frustrations. Overwhelmed by complaints at Crow and elsewhere, PHS officers advocated the establishment of health committees at every PHS facility to act as a liaison between PHS and tribal councils and by extension patients. Perhaps not surprisingly, um, the Crow tribal chairman appointed Susie Yellowtail as chairwoman of this new Crow Health Committee in its formative years. The five-person committee, which happened to be an all-female committee, faced a two-fold challenge. Crows had a long history of voting with their feet when it came to health services. When hospital personnel implemented policies that patients disliked, tribal members responded by effectively boycotting the institution, so usage rates fell. Previously, this tactic had been reasonably effective in securing concessions from hospital staff and administrators, particularly with regard to um, more liberal visiting policies. But the tactic threatened to backfire in a context in which policymakers were working to close these hospitals. Officials had justified the closing of a, the government hospital at uh, Wind River in Wyoming, for example, based on it, inadequate use even though Shoshone and Arapaho leaders insisted that recent usage rates were atypical and a reflection of the unpopularity of the current position. So mindful of all this, Yellowtail and other committee members circulated flyers urging tribal members to, in all caps, use your hospital. And they, they regularly de uh, delivered this message at tribal council meetings as well. At the same time, the Crow Health Committee used the language of treaty rights to defend Crow's entitlement to government health services and to demand higher quality care than they believed they had been receiving. The challenge facing the Crow Health Committee was not only to ensure the institution's uh, continued existence, though that was important, certainly, 
The second component of their challenge was to reform it, to transform the government hospital into an Indian institution that could meet the evolving needs of Crow people. From Susie Yellowtail's perspective, um, this required an extensive, if informal, program of cultural education. Yellowtail would later censure those who, who, quote, make their living from us without ever making any effort to understand or get to know us. She argued that whites who come to work on the reservation need to understand our religious and cultural background in order to work with my people. One of um, Yellowtail's granddaughters, Jackie Yellowtail, recalls her grandmother's efforts to acculturate new doctors when they first moved to the reservation. Um, Jackie Yellowtail lived with her grandparents for a time as a child, and she remembers that doctors would come to the Yellowtail home in Wyola, where Susie would cook for them and, and tell them about Crow culture and life ways. The Crow Health Committee also acknowledged the legitimacy of some PHS officers' complaints about how Crow, Crows used or did not use the hospital, as well as about some patients' alleged unreliability in following medical instructions. Here too, committee members believe the answer to be educational in nature. The Crow Health Committee requested the appointment of a trained health educator on the reservation, and they strove to be actively involved in all health education initiatives. Yellowtail and her committee left perhaps their biggest mark in the area of maternal and especially infant health. By the time of the transfer to PHS, almost all Crow women had transitioned to hospital childbirth, with midwives assisting only about maybe 6% of all births, at least according to government figures. But the improvements in, Indian, in infant health that had been promised would accompany hospital childbirth had not followed. The mortality rate for all Crow infants under the age of one was 69.1% per 1,000 population, and that's compared to 26.9 per 1,000 population for all racial groups in Montana. So 69.1 compared to 26.9. And I should note that the, the situation at neighboring Northern Cheyenne was still worse with um, 137.3 infant deaths per 1,000 population. Um, so this, not surprisingly, was a major concern of, of Yellowtail and her committee um, and many others on the reservation. Native infant mortality decreased in the decade and a half following the transfer, due in large part to IHS's, uh, PHS's investment in improvements to reservation sanitation, an effort that Yellowtail and her fellow committee members actively encouraged. In meetings with health com committee women, however, PHS officers were more likely to use the language of individual neglect. They charged that Crow women neglected to attend pre prenatal clinics, they neglected to return for postpartum examinations, they neglected to bring their infants to well baby clinics. Physicians asked the women on Yellowtail's committee to help promote maternal and infant health services on the reservation, and the women agreed to do so. Um, they proved eager to do so. They, uh, th some of these clinics achieved record attendance in less than six months. But again, we see the committee working as a go-between here. They push back against the notion that poor attendance at clinics was a sign of apathy and instead emphasize structural obstacles to attendance. They advocated longer clinic hours and insisted that clinics be held throughout the reservation, not only at Crow Agency. Furthermore, from the perspective of most committee members, Crow women did many things to care for themselves during pregnancy. Um, in oral histories, women who gave birth during this period recall how the, the whole family came together to ensure that the pregnant woman was properly cared for. So while they agreed with PHS officers regarding the importance of medical prenatal care, the committee members made clear that their promotion of prenatal clinics was a matter of expanding the care that pregnant women received. By the late 1960s, Yellowtail had actually gained a national platform and her work on behalf of Crow women, children and families had extended to all native peoples. In the late 1960s and early 70s, Yellowtail served on the Surgeon, General, Surgeon General's Advisory Committee on Indian Health 
Um, here's a, a photo of, of um, the advisory committee with some, some IHS officers. And I wanted to note in particular that Yellowtail is standing next to um, another remarkable Native woman, um, Annie Wanika. Um, Annie Wanika is standing to her left. Um, Anna Wanika came to be a, a, a very dear friend of Yellowtail's, um, and she was a, a really important health activist in her own right on the Navajo Nation. So this position on this, the, the committee, um, this advisory committee, entailed traveling throughout Indian country, evaluating conditions, and making recommendations for improvement. Ultimately, many of the recommendations made by Yellowtail and the Advisory Committee on Indian Health found their way into the Indian Health Care Improvement Act of 1976. The purpose of the act, um, to quote verbatim, was to implement the federal responsibility for the care and education of Indian people. And you can think again of Yellowtail's consistent emphasis on treaty rights and federal obligations by improving the services and facilities of federal Indian health programs and encouraging maximum participation of Indians in such programs and for other purposes. So this idea of maximum participation was critical. The act authorized tribal governments to contract with PHS to provide health services on their reservations. And in fact, urban Indian organizations could also contract to provide health services for urban Indian populations. Fast forward to today, some Montana tribal nations run the hospitals and centers on their reservations while others, like the Crow Nation, run some of their own health programs. For Yellowtail, maximum participation of Indians in reservation health care carried another important meaning. Yellowtail's personal and professional experiences had convinced her of the need for insiders within the government health system. In 1971, Yellowtail was a founding member of a, a new professional organization of American Indian and Alaska Native nurses. And she spent much of the last decade of her life recruiting young Native women into the health professions. This mission is reflected in the language of the health care, Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, which authorized fun, um, funding for recruitment and scholarship programs for Indian men and women interested in health work. Um, this piece of legislation is, is one of, of several um, pieces of legislation in the 1970s that can kind of single, signal a, a real shift in federal Indian policy, um, a shift prompted in large part by the work of activists from this the termination era that I talked about a little bit ago to um, more of a, an era of Indian self-determination. I should also note that that Native Nurses Association um, honored Yellowtail at its annual meeting two years after this in 1978 as um, it recognized the Crow Elder as the grandmother of Indian nurses. So we've almost reached the end of Yellowtail's life, um, but everything that I've recounted thus far is really only one facet, admittedly a, a very big facet of Yellowtail's health and healing work. Um, and that brings us back to the Sundance, which I brought up earlier. So back in the 19th century, again, before Yellowtail's birth, the US government had prohibited crows from holding many of their dances, including the Sundance. To speak in very general terms, the Sundance is a ceremony that brings community members together to pray and dance for healing, and individuals make personal sacrifices um, on behalf of the community. For the first decades of Susie Yellowtail's life, this component of crow healing practices was banned. But as I mentioned earlier, crows reintroduced the Sundance in the early 1940s after Susie Yellowtail's return to the reservation and her marriage to Thomas Yellowtail. At this time, Thomas's brother, Robert, Robert Yellowtail, was the superintendent of the reservation, the first Native American to, um, to act as superintendent of his own reservation. And he welcomed the return of the Sundance as well as the revival of some other cultural practices. Thomas Yellowtail was among the, the men who played a leading role in this effort, the reintroduction of the Sundance, and he was among the earliest dancers. Only men danced in the Sundance until the mid 1950s when a Crow woman requested and received permission to dance. Susie Yellowtail was among the first Crow women to dance in the Sundance. This was right around the time when she became chairwoman of the, the Crow Health Committee. The following decade, the Yellowtail family received a tremendous honor 
when John Trujillo, a Shoshone healer and Sundance leader, bestowed his medicine upon Tom Thomas Yellowtail, who thereafter had the right to lead dances and to use his medicine to heal others. Susie Yellowtail played an important role in assisting her husband's healing work, and this included joining him on his travels throughout the country and into Canada in response to requests for healing. And I thought this was important to mention here toward the end of her life because it really speaks to a continuity of that concept of medical pluralism that I introduced at the outset. Susie Yellowtail died on Christmas Day, 1981. Her legacy today is wide ranging. We can certainly see her legacy in the ongoing work of her many descendants. Uh, we can also see a continuation of her work in the many grassroots Indigenous women's health organizations that are providing culturally appropriate and really culturally rooted services throughout Indian country. We can also see it in the efforts of Native men and women to reform and expand IHS services on and off reservations. The causes to which she dedicated so much of her life have become all the more urgent as Native communities have faced the many challenges of the ongoing global pandemic. The timing seems right to remember and honor Susie Yellowtail's story and the complicated and important histories her life allows us to explore. So thank you for being here today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to drop them into uh, the chat and I'll share them in the next couple minutes. Um, Brianna, would you actually, I, I have a question <laughs> personally. Um, can you speak about how Susie made the transition from chairwoman of the Crow Health Committee to then you know, being appointed to the Surgeon General's Committee? Can you speak a little bit about how she got involved in that? Yeah, I, I, so that's a great question. And I actually, it's one I haven't entirely um, figured out the answer to because, um, so I've seen a few references to, um, so I, I guess I should say there was this um, woman named Therese Hinkle who was herself a nurse and she kind of did the self-published volume of a bunch of different newspaper articles and, and other sources regarding, um, regarding Susie Yellowtail and her story. And so that was a starting point for me. And I, I sometimes see references to her having been appointed by, um, by um, Kennedy, President Kennedy. So that would be the early 1960s. And that may very well have been the case, but um, it's only in the Johnson administration um, that I've been able to find like references in newspapers and other things that that kind of corroborate that. So I, I don't know. I've I've kind of played it safe, and I, I know that in the that I know that she served through the the Johnson and Nixon administrations. I I'm a little less clear about the the kind of the origins and how early that started. Um, but I do think it was part again of this kind of shift toward self-determination and this maximum participation, um, uh, which, you know, that was in the 1976 act, but I think you can see this kind of shift toward um, more, more, um, more native involvement in the establishment of policy, right, and legislation. Perhaps, if I can just back up a little bit, perhaps one, um, what might have been uh, the transition for her was she was also involved not surprisingly, with the introduction of the Community Health Representatives Program, the CHR program at Crow. This is a program, um, it followed, there were pilot programs at Northern Cheyenne and, and Pine Ridge um, in the, the late 1960s. And after those successful pilot programs, the, the government um, PHS contracted with tribal governments to hire Native men and women to work as lay health aides in their own communities. Um, and, and so I, it seems very possible to me that Yellowtail's involvement in that work might have, have made those um, above her right more aware uh, within IHS, uh, IHS officers more aware of her and her work, just like Annie Wanika's work um, on the Navajo Nation in these in the same time. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I have I have another question. Uh, by the way, uh, Cecilia on our Facebook page says that this was fascinating. Thank you very much. Uh, so a more general question is, um, can you speak a little bit about how the closure of the hospital in the Northern Cheyenne Reservation may have affected or, or um, maybe complicated or changed or how, it, how that affected healthcare on the Crow Reservation as well? Yeah, so I, I talked um, maybe midway or so through the talk about this um, series of closures, hospital closures that began in um, began in some places during the war, um, but then continued after the war. And so at Northern Cheyenne, their hospital closed against the wishes of, um, of many Cheyenne, Northern Cheyenne people in 1947. Um, and that was a hospital that was had been introduced much later. So it was only in 1926 that the hospital had been um, introduced in the community to begin with, um, there for about two decades, and then that closed. Um, and, and right at the same time in 1947, 1948, the, the hospital at the, on the Crow Reservation was also under tremendous pressure. Um, there, was, there were several efforts to close that hospital as well. And really, it's kind of remarkable um, that Crows were able to just basically have this united front in fighting this and in, again, emphasizing so many of the themes that I mentioned throughout about their, their rights to this hospital, um, they had were able to kind of see what was going on in some of the places where these hospitals had closed. So after the Northern Cheyenne Hospital closed, um, for one thing, that meant that they had to then go to Crow Agency for hospital services. So I've, I've interviewed women who, you know, in the 1950s were having to go to Crow, like to have their babies, not even to mention like prenatal care, which was very difficult in this context. Um, and, you know, they all remind me there were not paved roads then, right? So to, to do this drive could be quite onerous. And so what, what started to circulate, what happened in some cases were women would give birth trying to get to Crow Agency. So give birth, right, in route. And, and so those stories also circulated at Crow, you know, and so I think that that was part of the, their real um, insistence on defending, you know, the, the con con continuation of this institution. Um, but then the other thing that did happen with, with um, in, the, in the short term at least, the, the influx of Cheyenne patients, Northern Cheyenne patients, at Crow did actually um, kind of, it was a challenge logistically um, for the resource, you know, this under-resourced institution to, uh, to, you know, all of a sudden almost double its patient load. So I do think in the very short term, there were a whole bunch of ch logistical challenges that accompanied that as well. And, and Northern Cheyenne would eventually then get a, a health center um, later, uh, but, but they were without health services for quite a while. Oh, I, I'm, you might be, are you muted? muted? I am, thank you. Um, it's fascinating, thank you. I'm just doing a final check uh, for questions. We really appreciate everyone um, who, who logged in with us today to join in. Uh, just to let you know, the presentation will be available on our Facebook page uh, for a long time. So you are absolutely welcome. Please share it with your friends. We are at the Western Heritage Center, we are huge fans of Susie and her work. And so any opportunity we can to push her story out is we're all for. Um, please check back with us April 29th. Our next High Noon presentation will be with Molly Kruckenberg, who is with the Montana Historical Society, a Montana Historical Museum, and she's going to be giving us an update on all of the, the new stuff that's happening in Helena uh, in regards with that organization. So thank you very, very much, everybody, for uh, checking in. Uh, come down to the Western Heritage Center and learn more about Susie. And uh, we'll see everybody later. Thank you so much, Dr. Theobald, thank you for Thank joining you. us.